special award. We're going to be working on chapter 5 tonight in our book on Old Testament narratives. Before we begin, let's start with a word of prayer. Father God, we ask that you would guide us tonight, that you would have your way in our midst, that you would teach us by your Holy Spirit, that you would give me, empower me as someone who really wants to relate information in a way that will help the body of Christ. I want, I want uh, to say what you want me to say. I want you to have, give us ears to hear that we may all learn tonight. We don't have all the answers, Lord. We know you do. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen. So I'd like to start by talking about, and sort of a, a, a word of wisdom and encouragement and admonishment all in one. Here is one of the titles that I gave as a resource that's on our group page. This is the Old Testament uh, survey book that's a complement to the New Testament survey book. So let's say you're in the book of Proverbs and you want to read about, you're doing some exegesis on the book of Proverbs, you want to know about the setting and what's going on with it, you can turn in this book to Proverbs it will give you the reason for the writing, the author, the dates for it. Uh, it, it will give you lots of information that will get you a long way uh, to learning the context within the book that you're reading. It's called A Survey of the Old Testament Introduction. So it introduces you to every book of the Old Testament. Now that would be the Protestant Old Testament, not the Catholic Old Testament. You're not going to find Maccabees in here. Okay, it is, uh, it is in its, I don't even know how many printing, the, this uh, author, Gleason Archer, if you'll see down there, his name is Gleason Archer. I want to tell you a story about Gleason Archer because I actually had Gleason Archer for a professor when I was doing my uh, seminary uh, work. Gleason Archer was, he when you walked into his class, he smelled like old books. <laughs> he was one of the curators of the ancient texts that Trinity Evangelical Divinity School held in its archive library. It had one of the original Gutenberg Bibles in that, uh, in that archive. He smelled like old books because he spent a lot of time there. Gleason Archer was in his 80s when I had him as a professor. He was an emeritus that still kept a full load. Those two usually don't go together. An emeritus professor carrying a full load? What? So that's the kind of guy, old oh, dude. I mean, he, he, was, the, he was the world-renowned uh, authority in Ugaritic. Anybody here speak Ugaritic? It's an ancient Semitic language. He had people coming who were studying ancient texts. For, they would come from all over the world to talk to him about texts and how to read them and all of that. And I had Dr. Archer for an Old Testament class. I had him for, for um, boy, I don't remember now. Anyway, the, the funny thing was is that we were in class and he was so... He was permeable, like he, easy to talk to, very approachable, and we were in a discussion about something on the Pentateuch, one of the first five books of the Bible, and I don't remember who brought it up, but Dr. Archer, you are such a learned and well-studied guy. You must feel like you finally made it to a summit in your faith, and he said, I can't tell you how much I feel like I've only just begun. I've only scratched the surface. And it was funny because you may not know me well enough yet, but I'm, I'm somebody who will shoot my mouth off and not think about it. And I said, but Dr. Archer, you wrote the book on the Old Testament. How can you not be, you know, accomplished? He said, the Lord is deeper than we can ever imagine. We have more to learn from him and his word than we can ever accomplish in a lifetime. But that, then the second thing was, that's no reason to stop climbing. And that's what I want for us here. 
I, the reason I put these out here, I have Old Testament survey book. If you never get this, that's okay. I understand. I'm a, I'm a Bible geek. I'm into this kind of thing. I read it like it's breathing for me. I get that. But I'm excited for this. The, the, even if you know that this is available and you come up to me and say, Tom, can I borrow that book? I will lend it to you. And you, if you forget to give it to me, I'm just going to rebuy it. <laughs> so I just told you you can steal from me, I guess. But this is one of those that if you, want, if, if you want something in your biblical library, this is one of the somethings to have in your biblical library. Why? Because it's that valuable. The, I, I recommended a New Testament version. Yes. Um, it's, it's on the, the, the group page. If you have the app, you can go to resources in our group, and you'll find the listing of the New Testament introduction book. This is the Old Testament introduction book. If you uh, were reading <clears throat> the links that I sent, I hear the other two books in the flesh or in the paper. Um, the Art of Biblical Narrative by Alter is another one of those I really geek out on. It helps you understand even more how to read and understand biblical narrative. And then this one, he gave us stories. So as we talk about narrative, right, that's basically, here, here helps you understand what the word narrative means. They're stories. They're stories of God's people with all of their warts, all of their foibles, all of their problems, difficulties, whatever you want to say. Think about... Some of the very talked about, most talked about people in the Old Testament, figures that you think about, they're idiots, screw-ups, knuckleheads. And when you read in the uh, book of Hebrews, chapter 11, there's this list of great Bible characters. Just read through that list in Hebrews sometime. And then look into their stories. You know, the crazy mixed up, difficult, problematic lives of people who are even, I mean, they're listed in Jesus' lineage, right? You've got really weird people in there and because they're people, but they're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And so as we get into talking about the stories, I want to make sure that we understand what we're talking about. So narratives basically means story. And I wanted to read right out of, out of the gate, page 93 of our book. It's, I think, down near the bottom of the page. It says, Unfortunately, failure to understand both the reason for and the character of Hebrew narrative has caused many Christians in the past to read the Old Testament story, and what's that next word? Poorly. Poorly. I, I think that there's a bunch of belief that we have about Old Testament stories that you and I have taken in, grown up with, tucked in bed with us at night, that are absolutely a misinterpretation of the Scripture. Or we're taking it, and we get there al al along the wrong means. Like... You get to the right answer, but the wrong way. Have you ever gotten lost and end up, ended up being where you thought you needed to be, but you didn't know how you got there? Yes. Okay, so we can do that with the Bible as well. We, we can misunderstand so easily. This is probably, for me, as far as reading correctly the Scripture, Old Testament narrative is probably the one that is the most important of all of them. You know why? Because of that statement right there. Unfortunately, failure to understand both the reason for and the character of Hebrew narrative has caused many Christians in the past to read the Old Testament story poorly. And then it continues on. Incorrect interpretations and applications on narrative are much more prevalent, are much more prevalent than anywhere else in Scripture. Any other part in Scripture. I, I agree with the author there. I think that we have to be careful how we apply Old Testament promises 
to you and me. We just need to be careful. I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes. I'm just telling you that if we're good exegetes, if we're, if we're looking into the original context and the original writing, and we understand the original purpose for, for a narrative that we're reading, then we're, we're, uh, we're better off than misinterpreting. And as, as you read the chapter, if you got a chance to read the trap chapter, did you get a feel for how easy it is to misinterpret? It's easy to misstep, right? You know why? Because we're here, like we're 2024. We're way, 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 way over here. And way over there, 10,000 years ago or something, eight, 10,000 years ago is Genesis, right? And we're trying to figure stuff out from that far away. The problem is we have 2024 lenses on. That's why we misinterpret the Old Testament. And we, we have errors that we've inherited that we didn't even know we inherited. And there, you know, this, the text talks about those. So the, uh, the, the text really does a great job of helping us remember that there are how many levels of narrative going on? Three. Three. And is, is anybody confused about that three levels of narrative? I'm, I'm going to do a, hopefully a, a service, not a disservice to you, by drawing the three levels of narrative. Would that help? Yeah. Okay. So let's start by saying, let's understand that the scriptures start with what book? Good job. It's not Jesus. Okay, we start in Genesis and we end in? The appendix. We end in the appendix, people. <laughs> no, we end in Revelation. Okay. So, this is the Bible. Genesis to Revelation. Within this Bible representation that I've written up here, over 40% of the Bible is narrative. It's stories being told, right? And within that, Lots of things are learned about God. And the, the big story, well, let's just leave it in black. So the big story is like a big ribbon up here, like this. And the top level, level number three, the bigger level, is called what? The meta, meta narrative. It's called the meta narrative. That's the term that... Uh, was it Lee? You had me redefine? I think. I think that when I said meta-narrative, or it was, it was supracultural, that's what it was. Well, supracultural and meta-narrative means the same kind of thing, right? It's overarching, right? So, yeah, well, let's, let's blame Dan, because he's always asking. Okay, so I just wrote, like, okay, meta-narrative basically means the like the overarching story of redemption, okay? So story or, uh, or story of redemption. So this is looking more at like the larger movements of scripture. Over here, garden, then we move to uh, fall of man, and then it moves over to the patriarchs, which are, you know, the, the, father, the early church fathers of the, of the faith. You've got Noah and his sons. And then you, it's this telling the story of, of how God gets his way all the way to. Um, so it's kind of like God enters the picture by let there be light. And he re-enters the picture on a white horse. You know what I'm saying? So in between those two arrows is this, this meta-narrative. It's, it's the weaving of God, you and I in God's story. I thought it was important to say that the text says that you and I are written into this story. You and I are in here. As soon as we enter God's kingdom, we become followers of Christ. Y your story is this story. Right? Okay? So then underneath that, let's see if this pen writes, holding that up is this cross timber, right? Right? And that's level two. Do you, do you remember what level two is called? It's um, God redeeming a people. 
it's, yeah, it's God. So theta is God. That's my, that's, that means God. In, yeah. God redeeming his people. So that's, yes, Old Testament and New Testament covenant. And covenant's the big word. And, and covenant's the big word, meaning God promises to do this if we do that, right? Here's your part, here's my part. And at the beginning, God says, I, I need you to do these things. And, and basically the Old Testament setup of, of God's redeeming his people is come to the temple, sacrifice things. Are our, are, our sin, are our sins forgiven if we're Old Testament folks when we go and sacrifice an animal at the temple? The answer is no. No. Do you know what, do you know what the Old Testament sacrificial system is? As a car guy, it's bondo. It covers over a multitude of sins. So if you have a crinkly fender... Bondo covers it, but is the, is the crinkled fender still there? Yes. What happens in the New Testament with the New Covenant, God removes that fender. You get a new fender, right? And so instead of covering a multitude of sins, the New Testament Covenant, Christ comes down and in the redemption story takes that brokenness of us and supplies a new one that's his. He pulls your inside, innermost being out and places himself there. Okay? So then you've got... See how we're building a building here? I hope it looks kind of like a building. I don't know. Maybe it would fall if I was in the, building it in the Old, old uh, Testament days. But then you've got all these columns of individual stories, right? Column after column. And this green pen isn't doing great, but you can see that. I hope. And these are individual stories. Like we'll we'll write Moses, uh, Joseph. These are not in order, obviously. Abraham. We can we can put the entering the promised land of Joshua. You see what I'm saying? There's these individual stories that God is using, and it sort of breaks from the larger to the smaller to the individual. And <clears throat> these make up this. Do you see that? But they support this whole, this whole idea of all of these stories, all of these stories of, of God's people. And so this is, this is level three here. This is level two here. And this is level one here. And so... Sometimes we get in trouble when we forget about these three levels. That's what the author is trying to say. Like you can read into this from this. This is a part of this. But to to misunderstand that leaves us in a place where we misinterpret Scripture, misapply Scripture, and then we, we end up building false teachings in our churches. And... Uh, did you notice there was a lot of negative in this, in this chapter? There's a lot of what it is not. You know, did you read that section there? So um, we have the, the le- three levels of character, and then, uh, and then he f- finishes this whole section with what narratives are not, right? And, and frankly, the stuff that this, this text goes into, talking about things that Scripture is not, is stepping on a lot of toes of the church in its days gone by. One of the things we read about Old Testament narratives is not an allegory. Did you read that? For a long time, the church held that that's that's what they were. See, you could could read an Old Testament narrative and, and look at all these different, well, this means that, and that means that, and that means that, and that means that. The problem is that's bad exegesis. Even though it's got a lot of history in the church, does that make it right? No, it does not. We, we're, we're misinterpreting Old Testament narratives when we use it as allegory. You, you understand what an allegory is? No. Like, okay, so um, 
Let's take a New Testament passage. What's a parable that Jesus talks about? The four soils. Okay? We can read the, the, the parable of the four soils and apply too much meaning to the text. And we can say that, we can say that now I'm going to go way off and make it silly, but we can say that Jesus is talking about soils to the point that we understand that everybody, if you're a Christian, you should be a farmer. You see, because the allegory says that farming is the only righteous way to live, because Jesus is talking about salvation with respect to agrarian imagery, right? So one of the things Jesus is trying to say to us is that the only righteous way to live is to plow ground or raise cattle. Or, you know, um, there are four soils, so therefore there's only 25% of, of, of people that are saved in any, any, any group of people. But wait a minute. What if there's a bunch of truly saved people and they're in a small group and they're talking? Could we apply that? Could we say that there's four soils in, a, in such a hard way that we would say that there's only, there's only one quarter of people that are rich soil? Is that what Jesus is saying in the... Well, we can say broad, more broadly that it looks like there's a lot of people that look like plants that are going to last, but not all of them do last. And so the ones that we want to be are the rich soil. Well, see how we can take that and, 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 and try and pull things out of a, of a story or a narrative that are not, are not um, supposed to be pulled out like that? Um, there, there is a whole area of interpretation that's allegorical interpretation. Some of the craziest stuff comes out of there. And our author rightly says they are not filled with hidden meanings. I, I even, I, you're, you're going to be mad at me, some of you, but numerology, I don't trust it. I don't think that's a hidden meaning. I don't think that the original audience ever said, well, that, that meant that, and that meant that. So he's, there's all the, you know, Psalm 119, all of those uh, Hebrew alphabet, that's all this and that and that. Never in a million years would somebody in the first century B.C. have known that, that kind of technical stuff. It's cool, it's clever, but don't put your faith on it. Now, do, do certain numbers have influential meaning in there? yes. We understand that sevens are perfect. How many days did the Lord use to create? Seven. Because seven is a perfect number. It's a way that everybody, when the original audience would have heard that, would have understand that, that, that creation is perfect. It's poetry telling us that God created everything. Nothing exists except God spoke it into being. Right? So we have to be careful and understand that there are things that we've done in the past and that we may be standing on that is not the way to interpret narrative. So allegory, where there's extra hidden meanings in everything. That's not what an Old Testament story is telling us. Um, they're not intended to teach moral lessons. It's, that's Aesop's fables that you're thinking of. The, the Bible is way bigger than Aesop's fables. To reduce the Bible to Aesop's fables, can you imagine? It's doing a disservice to the God who created the universe with a word out of nothing, right? So it, it is not trying to teach a moral lesson. It's trying to tell you what happened, right? Okay, and then it's not explicit teaching. It's usually implicit teaching within a story. Um, does the, what, which, uh, which story does the author use here? Is it Gideon? Is it Gideon? Is that right? Yeah, he uses Gideon here where he's trying to say, you know, he's using Ruth as well, but he's, Gideon, it's, it's not about how to, how to understand the will of God. It's teaching us by story that God is faithful, despite us being unfaithful and distrusting. Right? Gideon was a knucklehead. Every step of the way, did you watch the videos from the Bible Project on this? Yeah. Wasn't that good? Yeah, it was very good. It, it did a better job than this teacher will ever do. Oh, he's doing a good job. 
But it's, <laughs> praise God, man, the Lord is good, right? Yeah. But Gideon, he was a knucklehead. And he was, I love Gideon's story, man. He was just so distrustful at every step. Lord, I don't, how can I know it's you? Maybe it's my mind. Maybe I'm just, it's my thoughts. And when, make it, make the fleece dry and have everything else wet or make the, make the fleece wet and have everything else dry. That's not a, a handbook on how to determine the will of God. That's a handbook on God is faithful despite your unfaithfulness. It's because God said that he was going to do it, not because Gideon had to discern it perfectly well. And so um, the, this idea of explicit teachings, aren't, it's not teaching you explicitly, it's implicit. Usually, you'll find explicitly taught somewhere else the lesson that's implicitly being exampled in a narrative. So, honor your mother and father. And there's lessons that you see, both positive and negative, in the Old Testament narratives, don't you? In the, in the, in the Ten Commandments, it's the only, what does Paul say? It's the only promise, only, only commandment with a promise? You know, it'll go well for you if you honor your father and mother? I mean, think about some of the stories in the Old Testament that implicitly talk about that truth. Whether it's, I don't know, what <coughs> Noah and his sons after he gets off the ark. and I mean, just so many stories of, uh, about that, that concept. So narratives don't explicitly tell something. It's like they're, they're operating from the truth that they're implicitly telling you about. So watch this story go. And behind the scenes, if you pay attention to the story, you're figuring out, oh, he's, the author is giving me these stories. To, he's, he's kind of talking about this or that truth. Are we, is that confusing or is, do we understand that? Like it's not explicit. It's not going to come out and do an Aesop's fable for you at the end. So the moral of the story is, you know, and I will tell you something. As you read this chapter, when I... Does somebody have a question? Oh, okay. Well, A E S O P, Aesop, ancient writer, wrote all kinds of fables to teach morals. And they were always to try and teach you some lesson or another. So, thank you. Sorry, I ran right over that. Um, the Old Testament narratives are there to teach us lessons about. God and, and how his, his, his redemption is working throughout history. And I love it because as you, as you think about it from a more global standpoint, think about the many ways that the enemy has tried to get in the way of, mess up, thwart, stick it to God. And every step of the way, God's hand working, 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 working. Now, this is the pastor in me. If that was true back then, is that true now in your life? Yes. See, this is how to apply the meta narrative, the, the, the third level. As I think about how Scripture unfolds, and my life is difficult in this moment, and nothing seems to be going right, and all I find are obstacles, or I, even my own choices get in my way. Because that, oh, that way, that, that never happens to us, right? Never happens. Our own choices never get in our way. Right, forgot. But even when they do, we have, we have this tremendous Father who is looking out for us, who is working His will in your life. And that though it may seem like Friday night, Sunday's on the way. Right? It seems like Jesus is hanging on the cross, all is lost, all the disciples have scattered, they're, they're asking themselves on that Friday night, wait a minute, God, I thought, wait, 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 what? I thought, no, wait, God, wait. He's not supposed to die, but he's, I think he's going to die. Wait, he died. Can you imagine Saturday? Are you in Saturday right now in your life? Does it feel like Saturday? Sunday's coming. Sunday is coming. Because this is what God's doing through all. We're heading to this arrow. Jesus is coming back. So hang on to that. 
the scriptures are trying to encourage you with that. The meta narrative of the story of redemption is the big picture of God is going to orchestrate this history that we're living according to his conclusion and none other. That's what this bigger one is. Here's, here's how he does it, and here's who he does it with. That's basically how to think of these three levels. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Say that again. Here's the story of God's redemption. Here's how he's going to do it. And here's who he's going to do it with. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when we think big picture, that is a generalized statement saying we're moving from the arrow in Genesis to the arrow in Revelation and... God is doing his thing. The problem is, is that there's an enemy and, and, and free will who works against God, even our own lives. I, you know, I wonder how much we need demons and Satan sometimes. My, at least my experience of my walk is that I get in the way of myself and what God's trying to do in my life. And it's only when I surrender and give up me that, that I become more me than I ever could have been. Isn't that strange? So, um, you have, did you, if you haven't had a chance to read the next section on the characteristics of Hebrew narrative, that's where you have the, uh, the narrator, the scenes, the characters, the dialogue, the plot, the features of structure, okay? Like any good story, all of those elements are in there. Only they're, they're better and more well done than any human book ever written. They just are. Some of the best, the best, I wouldn't say some of, the best poetry ever written is in the Bible. Yep. And why is it written that way? Why are all these, these plot and the characters and all of that why, is that, why is that so highly written? First of all, I'd tell you that the, I think the authors were divinely inspired. They were being inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? They, they were being led along on what to write. So, so that, they, they've got going, but why is it written in the way that it is? Because, did you read that little section in there? It's a little bitty spot in there, but and it, it, that's part of why I think we mess up interpretation, is that Scripture is meant to be heard, not read. Scripture was meant to be heard, not read. Scripture was written in the midst of an oral culture. How you transferred all of the truth that you knew as a father, as a good Hebrew father, was to tell your children the stories of God. And the scriptures were written poetically in ways that made it easier for the Hebrew ear to remember it. There are very clever things uh, that, that you, you come into contact with. Did you know that that actually Genesis 1 and 2, the story of creation is actually some of the highest poetry in Scripture? It's poetry. It's got repetition in it in a way for you to remember. It was morning, it was evening, it was the first day, it was morning, it was the evening, it was the second day, it was morning, it was evening, it's the third day. As you tell that to your children, they start repeating it. It's almost like a little rhyme, you know, that you get going in, in Scripture. One of, the, one of the, the, the longest psalm is Psalm 119, right? Did you know that that's poetry? It's a psalm, so yeah, of course. But it uses the Hebrew alphabet as its device. So if you look in your Bible, if you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119, you'll see over each section a heading. It says, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit. Look at it. You'll see it over every section. <coughs> That's the Hebrew letter Aleph. A, Aleph, Beit. And the next one's Gimel. And the next one's Dalit. It goes through the Hebrew alphabet. Every, every word line in that section of Aleph, every word starts with the letter Aleph, the letter Aleph in the Aleph section. Guess what letter every Beit's section starts with bait 
It's Hebrew, but trust me. It's poetry written in a way for you to understand, just like the Proverbs is, man, fear of God, His ways, follow Him. It's this beautiful poetry that's lost on us because we're way over here in 2024 trying to look backwards at that beauty of that stuff in there. You see that? So in the original Hebrew, that section is all going to start with that same letter. And it's just, it's, it's gorgeous poetry. Suddenly, Psalm 119 means more to you, doesn't it? It's amazing, God's Word. But it's, it, that's poetry. That's another, that's another chapter. But I just wanted to give you an idea of, of some, of the, some of the things that the, the Bible's doing. Um, I wanted to spend a little time on structure, features of structure, which is at the end of that characteristics of the Hebrew narrative. So that's, that's poetry again. A lot of times poetry is like, it's like a... Oops, that should be out here. Should be over here. And then... So when it's telling a story, you've got the beginning and the end are in parallel. The middle point is, is in parallel. And then it, here's the center of the story. So it goes out here and it comes back here. That's the structure, the framing and the structure that a lot of Hebrew uses. Um, and in, in uh, Greek more so, but Hebrew as well, Word order doesn't really matter. It's actually, if you want to emphasize something, you put it at the beginning or at the end of the sentence. And it's also true at the beginning or the end of a thought, the beginning or the end of a, sen- a section. That's, this is going on all the time in Old Testament narrative, where you've got this arc of a story, and you kind of end up where you began. And, and it's, it's doing that so it helps you remember what the main point is. Okay? So um, I think um, reading between the lines is all about, that's the Ruth and the Boaz discussion, right? And I thought it was important that it's not a love story, but it's a story of God's kindness. But, the, but Hollywood loves which part of it? The love story part of it. Oh, but that God's kindness thing, we're going to set that aside because that doesn't sell tickets. <laughs> but it's a story of God's kindness. A kindness through his story of redemption. Did you notice that? Key elements in there, Ruth converts to Judaism. Boaz is a very faithful Jew. Lives in an area that's a very faithful town. It, I mean, the text talks all about this. And that there's this story being told. It's a beautiful story. It's easy to remember stories. But the point of the story that's sort of in between the lines is that God is a kind God. He is kind. He is so good to Ruth, is he not? He's so good to her. So, so I just really thought that was good. And... So uh, the final cautions that he gives, there's um, it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are nine cautions that he gives. And I want you to be aware of those. I'm not, the, cautions because it gives you the errors of how we interpret incorrectly. Okay? When we interpret incorrectly, those are what the cautions are about. And that's, he's explicitly talking about some of the pitfalls we fall into interpret it, as we try to interpret the Old Testament. Um, very much worth it. And then it, I thought it was really helpful. At the very end, he gives those principles on the last page. Doesn't, isn't it on the last page of the t- chapter? What page is that on? Page 111. Thank you. We're better together, folks. <laughs> Principles for interpreting narratives. It's almost like if you didn't get to read anything else, read this page. And it's at the very end of the chapter. He just boils it down for you. And um, I think 
Any, any questions before we go? That, was I unclear about something? I mean, maybe, maybe that'll come out in your discussions. Um, I, think, I think I'll hit pause on the tape here. And uh, we'll... If I understand you right, that that was for then, and that's not for now. Am I understanding that right? Um, because the country all believes now they'll shoot as long as there's a gun in their mind. So even though as Christians we always say it, we want to always say it, I said it, I learned that, and it really threw me for a loop. It's like, what? Yeah. That was not... Doesn't that step on your toes a little bit? Well, it did. I yeah. Mad. Make, <laughs> hope so. Yeah. It made me angry. Like, yeah. Yeah. So what do I believe? Do I throw, do I throw the Bible at this guy? Right. Is that what it's, is that, is that, okay. So is that what it's saying? So what is he saying in the text there? Um, He's kind of indicating that we, we have to be careful how we apply that. Well, right. Yeah. So we should say it or we shouldn't say it? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think... If you're going to use that text to do it, you ought to be careful saying that. I think you ought to be careful saying that. You belong to the Old Testament time, like you said. Yeah. Now. now, does that change? But is that one of these level one statements that we're trying to move it up to here into level three and make that an all time forever statement? That's what we have to be careful. I think we are. But does that fit in the overarching narrative? Of when a when a I mean there's a principle there that when we are guided by God and He's in charge, not us, life goes better. So to stand on that passage to try and make that point, I think we're in trouble. Okay. But is there is there an overarching narrative that we can say, wait a minute though? If 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 we surrender ourselves to God, life's gonna be better no matter where it is. And so it doesn't discount that point. It's just saying don't proof text from that point of Scripture. So, and especially because, you know, one of the things that goes off in my head is that eventually that's not going to be true because Revelation ta tells us that we're headed to a really bad place in society. So eventually, so at some point, that, we can't apply that to that moment because the very thing... It has to happen, God says, is that the world's going to run after its own ways in such a, uh, to such a level that I'm, that's enough. I'm done. That's it. I'm coming back. And once for all, I'm going to fulfill Scripture. And I am going to make my kingdom here on earth. And the, the fulfillment of Jesus' prayer, thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, will be true when this final movement of revelation happens so to say that 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 level one story applies to a time that's maybe over closer to here in revelation is doing a disservice to god saying about what the times are and that doesn't mean that you can't do that on an individual level and have influence to those who are around you Say, let's do it. Let's do it God's way. Do I, now, am, let me make sure. Am I saying I wish that everyone would reject God and that we would just live like the devil in the United States? Is that what I'm saying? No, I want the, I want the world to follow God's ways. We would be better off if that's the case. That's, that's this level three statement. But to apply that and say, if, if only we do this, then, then it's going to happen again in our society. I don't know. I want to live that way. I want to live and, and encourage people to follow Jesus. But we have to be careful how we apply those things. But that does not change the fact that God eventually is the one that's going to have to write it all. He writes it all. He's going to. So I don't think that changes my faith at all. I hope it doesn't yours because Jesus is coming back and he's writing the ship. He's wiping the ship out and bringing his here. Just so that we understand how we, we get here. And living according to God's ways as followers of Christ, incredibly important. Okay, so there were two other questions and then we're going to have to go to small group because we're running. 
Yes, Wayne, you had your hand up. Right. Right. Correct. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and we need, remember what I said earlier on, the Lord caused the curses because he knew because of our free will being exerted over him and the knowledge of free will, of, of good and evil, gave us free will apart from God. <laughs> Suffering was the only thing that was going to wake us up. It's the only thing that gets through. That's why there's no, what do they say, there's no and, uh, and, anti uh, um, a- atheists in a foxhole, is that what I'm trying to get to? Yeah. There's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole because there's impending suffering to the point that you're turning to God, right? And what if the very suffering that is happening in our society now is, is a call to, for us Christians to wake up? I mean, I've heard, I've heard us pray multiple times, Lord, wake up the church. She's slumbering right now, folks. <laughs> I don't think she's slumbering at cross point, but it's pretty cool. Okay, I think we need to go to small groups. I don't know, just take your tables. And uh, you had a question. question. What is the role of the Holy Spirit in the church of Scripture? Um, That's a bigger one than I can get to. (laughs) Can we handle it on the other side of small group time? And I'll give me a chance to... To, to well to organize my thoughts on it right okay so i will i will answer that i promise when we come back together in in uh half an hour Seven forty-five. so let's see i'd say just break up into groups of five you got the students back there in the library two tables So it was Hal's question, what, what role does the Holy Spirit have in interpretation? Is that, is that right? Yeah, so... The role of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the old version. No, the the New Testament is great. Oh no, that's I I can bring it another night. So let's. I need to I need to pull this discussion back here because it's it's a big discussion. I want to make sure that I understand your question. So the X factor that is the Holy Spirit in all of this, right? So I think that without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the scriptures could not carry the truth to us. It would just be simple words, much like the world without the Holy Spirit interacts with the word of God and goes, well, whatever, that doesn't, it doesn't impact them. So the Holy Spirit is both the inspirer of the text, but it's also the inspirer of minds that hear the text. So is it the physical words that are there, or is it the God who stands behind the words that are there? And that's where I think we have the gift of the Holy Spirit helping us, because uh, we're reading an English translation of an original language. So if the Holy Spirit's not involved, we're lost. So we, we, we couldn't hope to understand who God is without the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Because when the, when the world looks at the Bible, they read it, and they think, oh, those are a, a nice set of tales, a nice set of stories, but it does not penetrate their heart nor open their mind. And so the Holy Spirit helps us interpret and understand what the scriptures are saying. But the, but the Holy Spirit will never tell us anything that, that breaks any of the teachings of scripture. So if we think we hear the Holy Spirit and it's telling us something that's not squared in scripture, 
or grounded in Scripture, then we're mistaken. Because Scripture is the, is the ultimate guardrail to our beliefs. So, yes. I'll just tell you the reason I asked that question. Is I'm a converted atheist. Yeah, okay. And I was, I was converted by reading the Bible. Yes. I didn't know Greek or Hebrew. Right. One, two, or three. Right. All I knew is I had a desire to know the truth. Yes. And it was just me and God. Yes. And that's how I got saved. Yeah, absolutely. Which, which proves the point that God doesn't need any of us. He chooses to work with, with and through us. He can work directly, which is what it sounds like he did for you. And, and yeah, and I, you're, you're, something about your heart, as soon as the Holy Spirit began to speak to you, Changed. responded. Yep. So, but I, I think it's, it's important because when we, when we hear something that someone says that's a new word or they say they, they claim, and this is the way I always think about it first, if someone claims, and I'm using air quotes, claims to hear from God, I go to my text of Scripture and make sure that it's guardrailed by Scripture, whatever they said. You know, Myra, this is kind of in that same vein that we were talking about your question. Yes. If I give a word of testimony to someone, and this is your friend asking that, and, yes. and they is, you know, am I breaking the rules of Scripture? Is what you said you know, what, what that friend said within the framework of Scripture, then absolutely not. It's not outside of Scripture. It is absolutely sharing truth that God has laid on her heart. Yeah. And so this is, this is really getting back to the heart of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because I want to give Christians good, strong, confident grounding in what they believe and why they believe it. And that if we, if we want to believe something wild-haired, it may not be so wild-haired if we can read it in the pages of Scripture. You know, I mean, think about the testimony of the Christian witness. A man who is fully God and fully man was born of a virgin. Who, and the Scripture is not very clear how it worked, but was overshadowed, is the wording, by the Holy Spirit. Talk about the need of the Holy Spirit, Hal. Right? So how does that all work out? That's crazy, weird, wild-haired stuff, except the Scripture reveals that that's the way it's going to be. And not only that, but that it tipped its hand way back in the Old Testament in Isaiah when he said that that was going to happen. So I don't know what to tell you other than the fact that we can have wild-haired things but are absolutely grounded in Scripture because that's what Scripture says is the truth. And how does that all work out? I don't know. It seems like a paradox. And anytime I find something that seems to be exactly true and is a deep truth, it ends up being a paradox. God is both my Savior and my judge. What? How does that work? Well, He is. So, fully God, fully man. God is sovereign and we have free will. What? <laughs> How does that work out? I don't know, but they're both revealed in Scripture, so our theology better uh, entail those, both of those things. And uh, we, we can't pick and choose. One of, the, one of the cautions of this chapter was talking about picking and choosing and cherry-picking verses and twisting them to make them say what we want. Well, the, another part of that as well is true, is we can't ignore Scriptures that don't teach what we want, that teach what we don't want. Like, I don't like that verse. I'm not going to teach that. I'm going to believe that uh, I'm misunderstanding that text. Oh, wait a minute. So we have to let Scripture be our guide, not our theology, not our wants, not our desires. It is the final say in all matters of faith and practice. Mm -hmm. Scripture. Okay, questions from the small group time or other questions from, from our uh, Old Testament narrative text? Typological fulfillment. Did we? Did anybody follow that one up? Did you read that? There's typology involved, and was that confusing? That that term. <laughs> yep. So a typological fulfillment, a typology in Scripture. You'll be reading about something that is talking about in the Old Testament, a prophecy that the New Testament uses as a prophecy that it pulls into the New Testament. Maybe Paul will quote an Old Testament or Jesus is quoting, you know, something from the Old Testament. 
that was fulfilled in the Old Testament. How can that, I mean, Jesus is saying that's about him? Well, it's because it was a typological fulfillment. There is a local fulfillment at the time when the prophecy was written, but it wasn't ultimately fulfilled until it was in Christ. So typological just means there's a short-term and in a long-term fulfillment and a a greater purpose to it, right? Um, If you think about in terms of, uh, in Genesis, the curses that are being discussed there, and there's the, between the snake and the humankind, there's the, you'll strike his heel, but he'll crush your head. You know, that's, that's, uh, that's a story that was fulfilled over and over again. How many times was Satan's head crushed in the Old Testament? You know, time and time again by, by God. Or even Gideon, right? The, the enemies of God were crushed. His head was crushed during that time. But that was a local fulfillment again. The ultimate is what happens at the end of Revelation. When the... My, my, one of my son's favorite texts of scripture, where, when it says that the armies of God, or the armies of, of Satan were amassed against, against God and, and, um, and he, he slew them with the sword that came out of his mouth. And you know what that is, right? It's the truth. The enemy is defeated by the sword of truth. God, Jesus is speaking truth, which, which kills them. And then it says, and the vultures gorged on their bodies. And my son's like, oh, yeah, the Bible is so cool. <laughs> it's better than anything he read in any of his fantasy novels or anything of that sort. Revelation uh, 19. 19, and then, yeah, there's some cool stuff in there for my I mean, it's cool anyway, but... Um, Eventually, the last chapter we get to is Revelation, and um, we will revisit this allegorical, not interpreting the Bible with allegory because the Bible is not an allegorical book. A lot of Revelation has been allegorically interpreted. Well, this beast means that nation, and this beast means that nation, and this, this beast means this, and these horns mean that, and those eyes mean that. It's not why the Bible's written that way. It's not, you're, you're totally missing why apocalyptic literature is written. It's us in, in, the, in the more modern era trying to look back and make more meaning out of the Scripture than was ever intended. And, and you know, this... I want to say it again, and I... I it, it frustrates me how much the church is divided over interpretation of Revelation. Come on. I read the back of the book and we win. What else do you need to say? <laughs> you know, who was it? George Younce said that in the cathedral's quartet. You know, I read the back of the book and we win. That's the bottom line. And to argue over all of that, and when does Jesus come back? Mm-hmm. Jesus said he doesn't know. How come you think you can know? I do, I think so too. Because I think if he can get you sidelined into getting into fun little things or right. picking apart scripture or yep. getting into these little ways of doing things, yep. then you're not you're missing the whole story, yes. Yes. But you're also missing your whole reason yes. for being here. Yes. And and so your reason is to pray and to witness and to make a difference in people's lives. Yes. Can I, can I pull that point back into this drawing on the, on the board? Because I'm not trying to be clever, but it really does apply. Because we can get down into the weeds of these individual stories in Scripture and start trying to make them say stuff and totally miss the fact that this is going on, the, 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 the redemption of his people. And then the, the whole big thing is that, that God has a story being told in all the pages of scripture and all of the storybooks that have ever history books that have ever been written we can be down in here arguing over whether or not a passage should be applied in a certain way when this is what god's trying to tell us wait big picture don't don't get in the weeds so deep that you lose the the big picture and and that that breaks my heart when i find myself doing it because my problem is is i get sucked into stuff like that because i'm a bible geek i really am so the, I nerd out on stuff uh, with scripture 
in a way that's not always helpful. And, and th that's what happens to us, I think, when we argue over the minute stuff that doesn't have anything to, that has nothing to do with the story of redemption, it seems. Well, and not only that, but like, especially when it comes to revelation and stuff. Yeah. When you, when you get into, it's, it's like it's a movie or it's a video game or something in your mind. Right. And so you're not seeing the people next to you or the people around the world as people. Right. To me, you're seeing them as, oh, they're these people. Right, we're not seeing them they're as God sees them. Here. We're not seeing them as God sees them. Right. And so then, then it just becomes this, well, you deserve what you're getting. Yes. You know, because you're, you're putting it in, you're twisting the way it is. I, I don't know. I just think that Satan, it gets into love that kind of stuff. He loves it. He loves it. I think so. We start arguing over stuff that has no relevance to eternal life. I mean, who, who cares when Jesus comes back? I can tell you what I believe, but... If, if I'm wrong, great. Super. It doesn't change a thing. It doesn't change my heart one iota, which is, I don't know, I'm a pragmatist, you know, where that's concerned. And here's that term I love to use. People ask me, are you a premillennialist or are you a postmillennialist? I'm a, I'm a panmillennialist. I think it's all going to pan out in the end. I really do. I think it's all going to pan out in the end. And to, to push interpretation on scripture in ways that it was not intended the text says it's to abuse the text our, our chapter this week the author says to misuse scripture in the ways that we see old testament narrative being used is to do abuse and violence to the text and, and for our own devices and so part of the thing that I mean, Wayne, you, you did a really good job of bringing that out. Like that, that particular verse we pull out of t context is Jeremiah 29, 11. Isn't that another one we love to rip out of place? We love to rip that out of place. Read that whole... That, <laughs> yeah. So we, we have to do the work that we learn in the first couple of chapters. Good exegesis is done based on what kind of thing? What is the context? What does the text say at large? And we've, we talked about epistles. What's the best way to re read a letter? Read the whole thing in one sitting. Don't just pull the verse that you want out of there. Read it within the context of the whole thing. And that will save you from doing violence to the text. And, and I, I think you hear me saying what I am saying as far as church and theology and how, oh, how we love to cluster. We love to cluster around these pet theologies that might be absolutely not founded in scripture and based on poor interpretation of scripture and sometimes we believe correct things but based on the wrong interpretation of scripture is it true that life is better when we have a theocracy because that's god's that's god's uh government did you know that it's not democracy it's theocracy and and it's it's really in the end, God is in charge of everything. And we follow absolutely because it's, it's our every instinct finally is to follow God. And so we eventually will get there. I want that. Will that happen in our lifetime? It's not if, but when. The whole world, the whole world will bow its knee. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Mm -hmm. That does not change how we read Scripture if we look at it from that perspective, right? It, it, our, our interpretations have to be set within the guardrails of Scripture. In Old Testament narrative, 40% of the Bible is narrative. Man, that's a huge section. We've got to get this right. I'm with you. I'm so excited by this chapter. Yep. Preach it, right? So can you believe that we're five chapters in and you're like, oh man, I, I'm only on chapter three, Tom. <laughs> That's okay. Hang, hang here with me. As, as we come together on Wednesday nights, 
I'm trying to teach the chapter so that you, you, know, you get a feel for the chapter if you didn't get a chance to read it. But read it, read it in arrears. <laughs> like look back and read it if you haven't had a chance to read it. Or just for next time, read chapter 6. If you haven't read 3, 4, and 5, just pick up chapter 6. They're kind of designed to be able to do that in some ways. Um, and and the, to, to let you know, there, there is um, some efforts um, to post all of the lectures. I think we have, there are four lectures that I've shared. Tonight's I'll share with Michael. Uh, one of them, I somehow sent him the same one twice, so he actually only has three lectures when he should have four. But they're, they're going to be available on the YouTube channel for church and they'll be in a playlist. Uh, I don't think they've gone live yet. I hope they haven't because chapter one and chapter three are the same. It says chapter three, but it's actually our, our lecture one. And that's not helpful to anybody. So uh, those are gonna be happening. I have, I've had several people ask me that. Um, so that, that should be going on the corner, uh, cross point community church YouTube channel. I think it says cross point home. Something like that is our YouTube channel. Uh, but, but they'll be there. That's where you can get them. Okay. I think it's cross. Is it Rockford? I might be in there. I don't ever remember. It's a link on my computer. It's like, what's my wife's phone number? I don't know. It's this button right here and it dials her. I can't remember. Right. So Let's close in a word of prayer. Would someone be willing to lead us in a word of prayer? All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the people that gathered tonight. And we hope they have a great church tonight. And just be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. See you guys next week.